If the moon rises with a halo round, soon we'll tread on deluged ground. These kind of sayings are really quite common as part of weather law, and that is what we're going to be looking at in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. I'm really rather well named today, considering we're doing well at all, because why not? It is a little bit confusing because I did this based on the Disney song from Bambi, April Shower, and we haven't had any. April has been absolutely glorious where I am, which is marvellous for the plants, but has thrown a bit of a spanner in the works for this episode, but never mind, we're going to crack on anyway. I'm not going to bother with a lengthy intro because this is going to be quite, there's quite a lot of pack into this episode and I don't want to ramble too much. So suffice it to say, I hope that you're well and let's just get cracking with this week's episode. Now, when I was having a look at weather law, because as I say, there was a, a reason for it with April showers and it's April, I did wonder if there was a difference between law and superstitions, particularly where the weather's concerned. And surprisingly, yes, there is, because superstitions are widely defined as being irrational beliefs, but law is slightly different. And Jacqueline Simpson and Steve Rowd explain that law about the weather consisted mainly of practical information and advice based on observation of nature and transmitted orally. Now, that quote came from the Dictionary of English Folklore, which I highly recommend. And what they're saying is the weather sayings are less like superstitions because they're actually based on what people have noticed. And then you turn that into verse so that they're easier to both share and remember. And there's another one, Jane Struthers shares one. Halos around the moon or sun mean that rain will surely come. And it gives you an idea of what you need to look out for and what that then means. So obviously I then think, oh, I have seen a halo around the moon or the sun, so it's going to rain soon. And it all comes from the fact that it's to do with the atmospheric conditions. I think it's water particles in the air then causes these sort of like refractions and so on. And that's what leads to the weather conditions. So you notice the build up to it, as it were, and then you get the, the effect. But obviously that's a lot harder to remember, whereas if you put it in a nice little rhyme and couplet, much easier to remember. And... Specific days do become really important within the calendar for like year long weather predictions. And we're going to come back to St. Swithin's Day because that one's a slightly different one. But St. Paul's Day, which is January the 25th, was also significant. And at this point in the year, if there were fine weather, it would mean that the harvest would be good. If you had snow or rain, it meant that there'd be famine and scarcity later in the year. And clouds or mist meant pestilence would strike the land and high winds would mean war. So someone should really check to see what the weather was doing on January 25th, 2020. But the idea with this is obviously if you had snow or rain on that day in in January and they say famine and scarcity, it's because the weather would then affect what a good harvest you had later in the year and so on. And that's basically where this whole idea comes from, that a specific weather condition on a specific day will then indicate what the weather's going to be like later in the year and also what the conditions are going to be like later later in the year, not just the weather. And according to Simpson and Rowd, the weather conditions on each of the 12 days of Christmas predicts the weather of each month of the following year. And I'm pretty sure we can all spot the flaw in that one, unless you're accustomed to blazing sunshine on the 7th and 8th days of Christmas, which is highly unlikely. And obviously I can't talk about weather law and specific days and not mention Groundhog Day. And it falls on the 2nd of February and the groundhog, Punxsutawney Phil, is supposed to leave his burrow in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. And if he can't see his shadow, then it means that spring is on the way. But if he does see his shadow because it's a sunny day, then he goes back to his hole because six more weeks of winter are coming. And this particular tradition in Pennsylvania dates to 1887. And it was originally devised by a newspaper editor in the area and he managed to persuade other people to sort of go along with it. And it's evolved into the celebration that it is now, 
with a whole sort of series of rituals around how it happens and obviously it's often televised and so on. And some people even think it's the same punks at Tony Phil, which would make him 133. He's also got a fairly poor success rate because according to History.com, he's only been right about 40% of the time. In all fairness, it's probably not that different from a lot of weather forecasters on telly, to be honest. But you do have to wonder exactly how accurate our lovely little groundhog friend is. But it's not without its precedent. History.com explained that the whole idea of Groundhog Day actually originally came from a German legend. And in this old legend, it was believed that a sunny day on Candlemas, which is also the 2nd of February would mean 40 more days of winter and eventually they clarified this to mean that the day was considered sunny and the support of winter continuing if small animals could see their shadows and then this evolved into a groundhog when German immigrants took that legend to Pennsylvania in the 18th century and then it evolved as I say into what it is today. So that's so much for law of specific days and we are as I say going to come back to St Swithin's Day but we're going to also look at specific types of weather and you might start to notice a bit of a theme with the types of weather that we're looking at. But we're going to start off with rain because that was the thing that inspired this episode in the first place with the little April shower song that they do in Bambi. Most of us don't really want to see rain, which is why it pretty much appears in so much weather law. But if you want to know if it's going to rain soon, the idea is you would look at the moon. So if the moon rises with a halo round, soon we'll tread on deluged ground. So the idea is obviously if you've got this halo around the moon that we mentioned earlier, then it's going to rain, hence deluged ground. You can also look at the flowers in your garden or by the side of the road, wherever they happen to be. And open flowers like daisies will actually close up their petals before it starts to rain because obviously they don't want to get wet. And if bees, butterflies and wasps suddenly disappear, again, it means rain is on the way. I should point out here, that's not an esoteric link. That's just because insects don't like getting wet. But it's where this quite simple, straightforward explanation then becomes like a weather belief or a weather saying but because there is this original observation behind it. I'm not quite sure where this one comes from, but if ducks quack more or louder than usual, it means rain is on the way. I've never tested that to see if it's true, but that is indeed what the folklore says. And now we're going to get on to St Swithin's Day, which is probably the most famous one where rain's concerned, and this is July the 15th. And the belief is if it rains on St Swithin's Day, it'll continue raining for 40 days. And to where exactly does this really specific belief come from? Well, St Swithin was the Bishop of Winchester in the 9th century. And before he died, he actually said he wanted to be buried outside where the rain could fall on his grave. He didn't want a big pomp and circumstance kind of burial inside. And a century later, the monks decided that he should be inside as befitting his status. And according to the 1973 Reader's Digest volume Folklore, Myths and Legends of Britain... St Swithin made it rain violently for 40 days so that the monks would give up on their plan. Elsewhere, I have seen that people believe that the 40 days of rain actually prevented him being buried outside in the first place, and that's why he ended up being buried inside. But either way, the the law still persists that rain on that particular day means 40 more days of rain. Again, I've no idea if it has any basis, like if there's enough evidence to back up the case, but it does date to the 9th century, so I imagine there's probably been quite a lot of wet Julys since then. Obviously we can't really talk about rain without talking about rainbows and nowadays we see rainbows as this really joyful symbol. Obviously in the UK people are putting rainbows in their windows as like a measure of appreciation for the NHS and so on and there was the famous kids TV program Rainbow when I was little and clearly you've then got the rainbow used in the pride flag and so on. But the rainbow wasn't always seen as such a joyful symbol and 19th century children would actually lie twigs and a cross on the ground to drive rainbows away and pointing at them could even invite bad luck. I've not been able to find out why that was but I do think that's really odd that we would see rainbows as oh yay there's a rainbow, there's a leprechaun with a pot of gold at the end of it but yet they saw it as something bad or worrying even. And rain may be annoying but at least it does water crops and so on. But storms, on the other hand, they were obviously a lot more dangerous. And an old saying attempted to provide guidance as to where you should and shouldn't stand during a thunderstorm. And it runs, Beware of an oak, it draws the stroke. Avoid an ash, it courts the flash. Creep under the thorn, it can save you from harm. So it's essentially telling you not to stand under oak trees and ash trees, but to pick some kind of thorny bush. 
And part of that is because obviously oak trees and ash trees are both quite tall, so they're more likely to be hit by lightning. So it's best just don't stand under trees. And Simpson and Roud also note an old belief that thunder could actually spoil stored liquor. And you'd need to lay an iron bar across the top of a barrel to stop the beer inside from going sour during thunderstorms. But what do you do if you're indoors and a thunderstorm starts? Some people advocate opening all the windows and doors to let the storm pass through the house. But they also advise you to cover any shiny metal or mirrors so that you don't attract lightning. Jane Struthers, on the other hand, vehemently disagrees and actually advises you to close all of the windows and doors and to stay inside until the storm passes. I remember when it was always advised that you turned off all your electrical equipment. I also, this is totally not even in, in related to weather law, but I remember whenever it used to thunder, my gran always said it was the angels rearranging the furniture in heaven, which is quite a nice way to explain thunder to a small child. But I've never been scared of thunder and lightning. I actually really like storms. That probably won't surprise you to learn that one iota, but there we go. If weddings took place during thunderstorms, the couple wouldn't have children. And Simpson and Roud also explain the belief that mothers shouldn't breastfeed during storms because brimstone and sulphur would taint the milk. Many of these beliefs were sort of coined at a time when people didn't really know what caused such extreme weather conditions. And you can probably guess where I'm going with this, but witches often got the blame for them, particularly storms at sea and the horrendous storms in the North Sea that almost thwarted James I's attempt to reach his new bride Anne, no doubt contributed to his penning of demonology. And David Bresson actually traces some of these beliefs around witches and storms to a massive thunderstorm in Central Europe in August 1562, and it caused so much devastation that people had never seen anything like it before, so they believed it must have supernatural origins, i.e. witchcraft. And this is one reason why you were told to break up your eggshells, because if you didn't, witches could use them to sail out to sea and raise storms. Now, witches might raise a storm by emptying their cauldrons into the sea. They might also tie knots into a rope. And as they untied each one, it would raise the wind. So the first one, I think you get a breeze. The second one, you get sort of high winds. And then the top one, it's a proper full on storm. Some witches were even reputed to be able to raise the wind by whistling and Jaquetta, who was mother of Elizabeth Woodville, wife of Edward IV, was accused of raising storms by whistling. The Newcastle Koran even included a fairly easy spell if you wanted to raise a storm and all you need is a wet rag and a piece of wood and you need to beat the rag with the wood and then chant the following three times. I knock this rag upon this stain to raise the will in the devil's name. It shall not lie until I please again. That's it. You say that three times. But then when you want to end the storm, you need to dry out the, the wet rag and then basically hit it with the wood again and repeat this charm another three times. We lay the wind in the devil's name. It shall not rise until we like to rise it again. So it's all about the idea that like the winds are coming up and down based on somebody's whim, essentially. But there we go. Now, obviously, you might not believe that witches can cause storms. You might believe that it's all meteorology. But how do you know if a storm is coming? If you're inland, pay attention to what flies are doing. And Struthers says that they swarm before a storm. And if you are if you are worried about thunder and lightning, apparently hanging mistletoe over your door was believed to protect your house from thunder and lightning. I found that a little bit of an odd one to find because I know there was a belief that Oak trees, if they got struck by lightning, that was God putting mistletoe on the tree. So it's odd that that would then also protect your house from thunder and lightning. But, you know, folklore can be quite contradictory, as I think we've learned so far. And for coastal regions, pay attention to what seabirds are doing. And this kind of makes sense. But they fly inland, or at least to land, when a storm is on the way. It was part of one of the very few bits of folklore I could find about puffins that they obviously like to head back to land when a storm's on the way because you wouldn't want to be flying about in it, let's be honest. And according to some superstitions, some sailors also believe that cats actually cause storms at sea. And one of the things is if somebody, like if a cat fell overboard or someone threw a cat overboard, I kind of think, why would you want to throw a cat overboard? That's just cruel. But if you did, that would apparently cause a storm at sea. Do not do that because that's cruel. And there are obviously links, as you might imagine, because cats are quite otherworldly anyway, but there are links between cats and weather predictions in English folklore. And when cats claw the curtains, it means that they're predicting high winds. And if they sneeze, it means rain is on the way. 
and frisky cats basically mean that it's going to be windy. So please pay attention to what your cats are doing over the next couple of weeks. And if any of those things are true, let me know because that would be quite cool. Now you may be wondering why this episode, as we're drawn to a close, has dwelt on rains and storms if we're looking at weather law. Because you might be going, hang on a minute, that's you've only looked at the bad side of it. And to be fair, it's because it's easier to find. It, if you look for weather law, a lot of what you find will be about wind, rain, storm occasionally snow but it's not all bad news because some law does relate to good weather and as Simpson and Rowe point out rooks gulls or swifts flying high are a sign of fine weather and if you see bats flying late in the evening that also means that fair weather's on the way. I would hazard a guess that where the bats and the swifts are concerned it'll have something to do with the insects that they feed on and speaking of or I don't want to say insect friends because they're not the arachnids but there is one relating to spiders When spiders weave webs by noon, fine weather is going to follow soon. So obviously if a a spider has basically built their web before lunchtime, it means that it's going to stay fine. And that makes sense because why would you bother wasting all of your time and energy building a beautiful web to catch your dinner in if it was going to be destroyed by rain? So that one, again, does make sense. And in a way, a lot of weather law basically works in both ways because if you look out for the omen that's foretelling bad weather and you don't see it, well, logic it takes that the good weather's actually on the way and vice versa. Now, you might be wondering, can we actually use weather law? And I'm going to go ahead and say probably not. Not like we've got such technological advances now that we maybe don't need it. And a lot of the time it's just a question of, you know, looking out the window and actually seeing what the weather's doing. And not everybody believes in the usefulness of weather law. And Fanny D. Bergen and W.W. Newell actually explain that the number of sayings that are true fall in the minority. And the ones that aren't true usually don't represent observation. It's more that people have just adopted a tradition or a common belief and it becomes true through repetition rather than through actual results, if that makes any kind of sense. And H.A. Hazen agrees and says that for the law to be worthwhile, it would need to be based on enough coincidences between the event and the resulting weather. Because let's be honest, one swallow doesn't make a summer. And talking about weather law in 1946, D. Brunt actually explained that many of the proverbs dated back to Theophrastus, writing in the 4th century BC. So that's quite a long time ago. And obviously climate does change. It really does. It's been proven that the climate does change across time. So looking at Proverbs from the 4th century BC now doesn't really tell us a lot about the weather now. And a lot of these were largely accepted until the 17th century when people actually started studying the weather properly. And to be fair, it's only by actually studying the weather and looking at the, the proverb that you can tell if they're right or not. And for Brunt, many of the sayings do have a sound basis, but because they're not based on meteorology, they're also considered unreliable. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't explore them as snippets of law rather than scientific fact. And Bergen and you will think that studying weather law is really important for anthropology, even if it's not for actual meteorology, because they show us what people believed and in some cases continue to believe. That does then give them value like as something to study rather than it just necessarily having to be useful. But that is the end of this week's episode. As I say, when I started researching, I was quite surprised at how much I was finding on rains and storms. And I was like looking out the window at glorious sunshine and all of the lovely plants coming up in my garden. And I was just like, yeah, this isn't quite going to be a season as I was expecting. But there we go. That's just how these things go. So I hope you enjoyed that. Next month, we're switching to Maker Month. I thought it would be quite nice to look at the folklore of some crafts because obviously a lot of people are now at home and maybe learning new things that they either haven't done in years or have never done before. I am starting with one that it's really unlikely that you're going to be doing at home and that's blacksmiths because I was talking about this with someone on Twitter and they were asking if I knew any and I do know a blacksmith so I'm going to do the blacksmiths first and then we'll be looking at the likes of spinning and weaving and things like that. So if there's a specific craft that you would like to learn more about and find out some lore or some superstitions or some legends and things like that do please let me know you can contact me on twitter you can contact me on instagram you can leave a comment on the blog post that is attached to this so the link will be in the show notes so if you don't use twitter or instagram please feel free to leave a comment on this post and say what you would like to to hear next month and i'll be more than happy to look into that for you i do have a vague notion for what i want to have a look at in june but it's not firm in my head yet 
So if there's anything specific that you'd like to hear about in future episodes, again, do let me know and I'll get on the case. Okay, so I hope you have a marvellous rest of your day, rest of the week, rest of the month. You know, it. basically, I'd love to hear see you back here again next week, safe and well. So I will see you soon. Cheerio.